Will quantum computing help us create a better world or will it destroy it? Now, if you learned one thing from me today, it's this. Quantum computers don't work by trying every possibility at once. Quantum computers don't speed up every single problem. They're faster for a certain set of problems, but there's only a few dozen or so quantum algorithms. Now, in traditional terminology, algorithm means just a set of instructions. But when we talk about quantum algorithms, what we really mean is instructions that actually harness quantum properties and can potentially solve these mathematical problems much faster than a classical machine. So you're saying, wait, only a few dozen quantum algorithms that are useful. What good is that? And can it run crisis? Really need to be asking the important things here. The answer here is that quantum computers could, in theory, simulate any classical system, so technically it can, but it won't do you any good, and I really don't have enough qubits for it. However, even though there's a limited number of quantum algorithms, the ones that do exist can have a huge impact on very important problems. Let's talk about these five quantum algorithms that can change the world, some that can have really near-term impacts. Quantum computing is coming into the real world, so be ready. And obviously, these are light overviews of each algorithm, and there are more things to go over, like the actual math, the circuits, and the steps, so subscribe to this channel to be notified when I put out new videos. But by the end, I think you'll start building a little more intuition of what problems can actually be quantumable. Number one, the Variational Quantum Eigensolver, or VQE, and chemical simulations. The Variational Quantum Eigensolver is one algorithm that can have really near-term applications. One thing you could do is simulate molecules and chemical reactions. And how can it do that? In chemistry, the properties of atoms and molecules can be found by solving the Schrodinger equation. However, the problem gets harder the more components, the more atoms you add. So exact calculations are hard above just a few atoms. There's always approximate solutions, but once you get up to a few dozen atoms, classical computers just can't do those problems efficiently anymore. And very quickly, we get to a point where we can't solve any of these problems anymore. So how does VQE work on a high level? What the quantum variational eigensolver really does is calculate the eigenvalues of a matrix. And it does so really efficiently for large matrices, which means we can actually calculate these properties of large molecules. The matrix that we use in this calculation is a matrix that represents the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian describes the total energy of the system of atoms and molecules that we want to consider. The quantum subroutine has two steps. Number one, prepare the quantum state and sets. And number two, measure the expectation value, which, if you're familiar with machine learning, can be thought of as the cost function. So we start with an ansatz, which really means an educated guess or assumption. For us, in the problem of simulating molecules and finding the ground state energy, we want to have a guess of the quantum state. The trick is actually preparing this ansatz. The guess actually needs to be pretty good. And what this hybrid algorithm does is actually uses this quantum step inside a classical optimization loop to help prepare it. The classical step then loops until we find the minimum eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, or the state of the system, which is the lowest ground state energy. And now you see why it's called variational. It's a mathematical analysis that uses variations, which is small changes in functions to find the maxima and minima, just so what we're doing here with our minimization of the expectation values. It also means, because of the variational principle, the expectation value is larger than the smallest eigenvalue of h. The quantum subroutine measures that expectation value and gets it closer to the smallest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, which is the ground state energy we are looking for. We can then use this minimum energy in other calculations, like modeling the evolution of the wave function and the wave function representing the molecule over time. Now I know this is a lot, but this is just an intro to the algorithms and what they do, so don't worry if you don't understand this completely. I plan to make videos in the future breaking down each algorithm separately and diving really deep into the math and circuits, so make sure to like this video and subscribe if you like that. Beyond just chemistry, the solution of large eigenvalue problems would have even more applications that would really affect our day-to-day -day life. Like, for example, designing new materials, whether they could be discovering new materials that, I don't know, stand up to higher heat or strain for airplanes, so maybe we could fly faster or make more effective batteries. We're coming into the NISC era, this noisy intermediate scale quantum device era, and our chips have only a few hundred physical qubits and have a high error rate, low coherence time, and they may need a lot of error correction. However, algorithms like VQE only need a handful of qubits to work and are a shallow circuit. A shallow circuit means that it does not really have a lot of sequential gates. That matters because quantum information can only be stored for a short amount of time, called the coherence time. We need to apply all the gates and read out the data before the quantum bits decohere. And the deeper the algorithm, the longer the coherence time. But how VQE works is by calculating some part of the data using a quantum computer and feeding that information back into a regular computer and looping back. It's what we call a hybrid classical quantum algorithm. 
So if we don't have a lot of gates that need to go in order, then we can have a shorter coherence time. Other examples of variational algorithms include variational quantum factoring. So actually factoring numbers for breaking RSA encryption in a new way. There's also quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which can be applied to scheduling problems, for example. Number two, quantum unconstrained binary optimization, QBO, used for optimization problems like traveling salesmen. Quantum annealers are built for translating these QBO problems and icing problems effectively onto quantum hardware. This is super useful because efficiency is kind of an everyday problem. We want everything to be more efficient in our lives, right? Binary objective functions, the ones that QBO can do efficiently, can be looked at as graphs. This graph can be translated onto the topology of the quantum chip. So you can take this optimization problem and you construct the Hamiltonian equation needed to minimize. And you can represent it with this graph where the nodes are A and B, the time they spend in each city, for example, to make the sale and the weights corresponding to that equation, and the edge between them, the A and B with the weight 7, may be the time that they spend traveling between the cities. The minimization of this function is the lowest energy state of the system. So practically, how does this work? We apply a magnetic field to control the superposition of the qubit, changing the probability of it being 1 or 0. And the weights here are controlled by the qubit superposition. You can do the same thing to the coupler, and that correlates the two qubits. And that corresponds to, say, the distance between the cities and the traveling salesman. So you see how these qubo problems can map from that equation onto the qubits and the connections between them. And for the optimizing solution, you can think of this as looking over a landscape and finding where the low point is. The lowest energy configuration is the optimal solution to these QBO problems. What other problems can it solve? Well, another one, for example, is a satellite placement problem. We want to determine where we should place satellites to cover observation of the points that you want. Another one is a nurse scheduling problem. So check out this video here where I talk a little bit more about quantum annealers and the differences between them and universal gate quantum computers, and some more on the hardware and applications of these annealers. Number three, quantum machine learning algorithms. Now, this is not a particular algorithm, but I did want to discuss a little bit about quantum machine learning and what it is and some of the research directions behind them. Quantum machine learning and the research can take different forms. So first, there's actual quantum machine learning algorithms on quantum computers. Then there are also classical algorithms inspired by quantum mechanics. We can also try to do classical machine learning on quantum data. All of these fall under the quantum machine learning umbrella. One major research push in quantum machine learning has been developing quantum versions of known classical machine learning algorithms. However, another direction has been to make quantum algorithms, all entirely quantum. For example, one is pattern recognition. But you can, like we talked about with VQE and we'll later talk about with Shor's algorithm, also have quantum subroutines. One idea is to have the quantum subroutine maybe prepare data in a way that a classical computer can more efficiently process or speed up a bottleneck in the training. A lot of research is being put into finding quantum versions of k-nearest neighbor methods or support vector machines and other classical machine learning algorithms. However, an interesting path going on is talking about quantum learning. How would quantum tech process input outputs and either optimize parameters and learn hopefully a new effective strategy for learning? How do we even represent data in a quantum way? There are proposals for quantum versions of neural networks as well. Most of them work with hot field networks, which are powerful for the related task of associated memory that's actually derived from neuroscience rather than machine learning. But how good are neural networks anyway? I talked to one of my friends in neuroscience a bit about this actually. Quantum neural network models actually work for a lot of things, but they're not great for some instances, and maybe a lot of instances. Just because this is an oversimplified representation of the brain, that doesn't mean that the whole neural network model is totally useless. Other approaches like modified convolutional neural networks could be able to deal with these special cases, and we can try to better represent what the brain does then. So quantum is not a perfect model here either. Now, there are a ton of approaches, like using quantum fuzzy feedforward networks or pattern recognition with adiabatic computing. There's still a lot going on, and it's still a really young field and has a lot of open questions and directions to research. I'll actually link a paper below that actually reviews the developments of quantum machine learning and introduces you to a lot of these concepts and how they relate to classical machine learning. So if you want to become involved in quantum machine learning, classical machine learning backgrounds are actually highly recommended. If you want to get started in that, I really recommend Andrew Ng's courses. His machine learning course is a classic, and his deep learning specialization is one of the best online courses I've ever taken. The impact here, I feel, is similar to any machine learning algorithms and the impact we've seen over the last years. We've seen a huge machine learning impact. You know, Google PageRank was one of the first examples of machine learning, and Google pretty much rules our life today. 
And now everyone can train a neural net pretty easily with just a few lines of code. But there's a lot of data in the world and it's only increasing. So we can hope that quantum can help with processing or making more efficient algorithms. Number four, Grover's algorithm for efficient search. Search complexity for unsorted databases is O of n using big O notation. Grover's algorithm, which actually takes the square root of n time, is the fastest possible quantum algorithm for searching an unsorted database. So a lot of other quantum algorithms are exponential speedups, and this is only quadratic. But again, think of how often we search every day. Wouldn't it be really impactful to have a quadratic speedup? But here's a key point. When you talk about Grover's algorithm searching faster, sometimes people may think, oh, it's just parallelizing. But no. Quantum annealers are built for translating these cubo problems and icing problems effectively onto quantum hardware. A better way to think about this is that the Grover's algorithm doesn't actually search faster, but it actually inverts a function. Grover's algorithm applies when you have a function that returns true for one of its possible inputs and false for all the others. The job of this algorithm is find the one that returns true. So what it really does is it searches the input of the function until it finds a single input that causes the function to return true. So even though Grover's can search faster, ask yourself, does your application have a way to map it onto the quantum system? So molecules are a little more clear to map onto quantum states, but how do you map a word onto a qubit state? And can you actually find a function that returns true for that specific input? It's not like what we can do with the quantum states is like what we can do classically with, for example, converting a string array into a map. And obviously there's some different complexities if we talk about binary search or something like that, but maps are much faster. So even though Grover's could work for searching, it does not guarantee that we can speed up every search. Really, the power of Grover's algorithm will come when search can't actually scale well classically, because remember, classical algorithms and parallelization are actually pretty powerful right now. For example, people ask me a lot about solving hashing with Grover's algorithm, but there's actually classical algorithms on collisions that are much more effective than Grover's. So what we really want to do is actually compare Grover's power against the best possible classical algorithms available, and not just in a normal case. So examples of these problems where Grover's can actually be useful and where the problem quickly scales more difficult classically are traveling salesmen, or graph coloring problems where you have to color a map, for example, with three colors and make sure the same color isn't touching. So while Grover's maybe won't be useful for every search, there is research going into implementing Grover's algorithms to solve NP-complete problems, and that would be huge. Number five, Shor's algorithm for fast number factoring, like breaking RSA encryption. Now, I've talked a little bit about Shor's algorithm in a couple of my other videos, because Shor's algorithm is kind of the first algorithm a lot of people hear about when you're learning about quantum computing. And they panic, breaking encryption. Two common crypto systems are RSA and elliptic curve. When you're online, any information that you exchange will be encrypted with an algorithm, and often one of these. And both of these are vulnerable to attacks by quantum computers. Multiplying two prime numbers together is easy, but taking a large number and factoring it to get those two primes is difficult. So it would take longer than the age of the universe right now to factor one 4,000-bit key with a classical computer. Shor's algorithm can actually find the prime factors of a number and can undo this factoring problem much more easily than a classical computer. And this algorithm was created in 1994. How Shor's algorithm actually works is by finding the period of a function. What's the period of a function? It's when you apply some operations and the results go up and back down, kind of like a frequency wave. So for example, you can take a number to the n and apply a modulus function to it, say 91. Prime factors of 91 are 7 and 13. Since it's a modulus, the remainder when it's divided by 91, you know that the answer can vary between 0 and 90, but not above that. So even as the number gets bigger, we can fit more 91s into it, and the remainder varies. This function has a period associated with it, 12, because once we get to 2 to the 12, the remainder is 1 again. So we can find the factors quickly if we have a fast way of finding the period of a known periodic function. There are five steps to this, but only one of them is actually quantum. Now, what known classical function do we have that relates to frequency and time? The Fourier transform. We actually have a quantum version called the quantum Fourier transform. A Fourier transform maps from the time domain to the frequency or the Fourier domain. Frequency is exactly what we want to know here, and quickly. Now, you may say this is trivial using 91 or 25. Sure, it is trivial, but it shows the proof of concept to understand why a quantum algorithm is faster than a classical algorithm and actually works differently. Now, why can this change the world? Well, breaking encryption is a pretty big problem. We're going to have to find new encryption techniques that stand up to quantum computing attacks. Now, it would take about 4,000 qubits to break an RSA key, except don't panic. These are actually perfect logical qubits. 
Because of error correction, we actually need many more physical qubits. John Preskill noted in his electron quantum information that we would need something like 10 million physical qubits to actually run the Shor's algorithm to break an RSA key of that size. And we're still pretty far away from that milestone, but it's something we have to consider. Hey, I said not all quantum algorithms are good, right? That makes quantum computing a technology with a lot of potential future impact, not even looking at the use cases in cybersecurity and telecommunications. So even though we only have a dozen quantum algorithms, the impact that they can have is huge since optimization and search problems, well, they're really everywhere. You can actually go to this website, quantumalgorithmzoo.org to see a list of quantum algorithms. As we look into more algorithms, they can actually help with a lot of optimization problems and even search. And really, this is the key to quantum algorithms and their impact. We have to figure out how to map the actual problem onto a qubit and the quantum states. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a little bit more about what problems can actually be quantumable. And if you did, please like this video and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.